Hey, listen, I got some great news. You want some really good news today? Jesus Christ is alive. And his power is at work in this world. It doesn't matter what storms are coming. It doesn't matter if the fires are raging. He is Lord. He is on top. He knows what's going on. And he's still impacting lives and changing lives. What a great morning, right? We get to hear the testimonies of salvation of Jesus Christ. He's still doing the work. The Holy Spirit is alive, my friends. Alive and well and doing great work in his kingdom here on earth through us. That's powerful, that's fun, that's something to celebrate. Go ahead and have a seat, if you can, right now. And um, man, I just love hearing those testimonies. Now listen, 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 listen. Little Abraham, Abram. That's what it's all about, right there. That's what it's all about. Um, I was lost, but now I'm found. Now, I need you to know, we, we listen to testimonies all the time, and sometimes people get into the baptistry tank and freeze. Adults have done it worse. Adults have had it happen. Listen, this is, what it's about is, do you know Jesus is your Savior? Have you repented of your sin? Have you come to a place where you have humbled your heart and you've recognized that you're a sinner and you can't do anything about that and you repent of your sin before the Lord and you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that he died for you and believe that he rose from the dead and that he is Lord. Is that what you believe? If that's what you believe, then you are saved, my friend, and you should be baptized because of your salvation, your testimony of salvation. What an awesome thing. I can't wait to see what God's gonna do with that little energetic car. You should have seen him before it all started. He was just running around all over the place. And we were like, let him run. He's getting rid of his energy. Otherwise, he's gonna start you know, making backflips into the baptistry tank or something. You know? His dad came around the corner. Where is he? Oh, he's just running. Go, yeah, that figures. Praise the Lord for the work that the God is doing in the hearts of people. And I'm excited that he's gonna do some work in the hearts right here today. Um, because he's promised that when his word goes out, it will not return to him empty. Now listen, his word has already gone out this morning. I need you to do me a favor. If you're a prayer warrior and you, are, uh, you know you're in the Lord and you've been in the Lord, especially if you've been in the Lord for a long time and, and you are a prayer warrior, you just start praying right now. Just start praying that the Lord would open the eyes of those here in our midst today or that are visiting with us wherever they are online would open up their hearts to the truth about God's love for them. But before I uh, jump into that, I just want to ask you, um, anybody know, um, anybody know who Johnny Lee is? Anybody know Johnny Lee? What are you, a bunch of Baptists or something? (laughs) Um, How about this, country western singer Johnny Lee? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, that Johnny Lee. So you know two people. Anybody else know who Johnny Lee is? Three? Anybody over here? Well, you would know him by this, probably. Um, He was famous for writing this song um, on his album, Looking for Love. And this is how the song goes. Oh, I'm looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in too many faces. Searching their eyes. And looking for traces of what I'm dreaming of. Hoping to find a friend and a lover. I'll bless the day I discover another heart. Oh, looking for love. All right, now do you know it? Now do you know it? All right. Okay, well now I've just given it to you because that song has been on my mind all day long, all week long as I'm preparing this sermon because it's just going on and on and on and on and on in my head. Now you get to take it from me. (laughs) I give it to you and I want you to be thinking about this. You know, am I looking for love in all the wrong places? I think it's safe to say that um, most of us, if not Let me just put it this way, okay? I think it's safe to say that all of us at one time or another are looking for love in all the wrong places. And because of that fact, you've picked a really good day to come to church. We're starting or launching our series, and thank you for your patience with us last week. We were supposed to launch this last week um, as we try to make decisions as to whether or not we're going to meet. 
Anybody want that responsibility? Just come up afterwards. We'll give it to you, okay? And you can make that responsibility. You know, it's like the minute we cancel it, it's gonna be like, it's okay, we could have come to church. And if we don't cancel, it'll be like, why did you, why didn't you cancel church? You're putting all of our lives in jeopardy because we wanna be good, whatever. It's just whatever. It is is what it is in northern Indiana. But I'm glad you've come today. We start our series called Build Your Life. Now get this, my friends, it's gonna be foundational choices that you and I get to make for survival. I'm super excited about this series because we're going to hear from the words of Jesus. We're going to go back into the Sermon on the Mount and we're gonna pull out different things that Jesus is talking about, giving us choices that we can make, foundational choices to survive in the world in which we're living here. I'm excited about the series because if we'll put into practice the things that we're going to hear right straight from the lips of Jesus, and if we'll put those things into practice in our lives, then we're going to be radically and permanently changed, and it will change the the course of our lives. And these foundational choices that we will be making to obey, listen to this, will guarantee, because they all come with a promise that we will survive any storm or onslaught that the world or the enemy brings against us, brings against our lives, brings against our homes, and our homes will stand whatever comes just the way that we've been singing on the firm foundation of the words of Jesus Christ. So take your Bibles if you're ready and go to Matthew chapter seven, verse 24. Matthew chapter seven, verse 24. Now what we find in these words at the end of Jesus' great sermon um, is his conclusion to the sermon. This is his sermon on the Mount, the Sea of Galilee. We just went through the introduction to his sermon with the Beatitudes. So here he is sitting on a hillside right off the Sea of Galilee in Israel. And Matthew tells us at the beginning of of chapter five that a great crowd has been following him. So Jesus decides to pick up spot to sit down and teach the people through his disciples. Now what I mean by that is he sat them down to teach his disciples knowing that the people would sit down and listen also. So he wants to teach them what's expected of those who are truly in the kingdom, who are truly children of God and people of God. And so these words in Matthew 7, 24, they actually are the conclusion to his sermon. We studied for weeks on the first several verses, the first 12 verses, which is the introduction to the great sermon. This passage I'm gonna read to you right now that we're gonna read together, Matthew 7, 24, is the conclusion to his sermon, and this is what he said. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I want you to notice that this thing starts with the word called therefore, okay? And um, I was always taught in, in Bible school that if you're in the Bible, if you're reading the Bible and you come upon the word therefore, you're supposed to ask the question, what is it therefore, okay? If here's what the word therefore means. It introduces a logical result or a conclusion. And so what Jesus is doing here at the end of the passage, at the, or at the end of his sermon in this passage, is saying, now let me wrap it up with this simple illustration. Here is the logical conclusion to what I've just taught you in this great sermon. You have two home builders. They're building a home for themselves. One's a wise builder, and the other is a fool. That's what he's teaching us. So let me, let me illustrate it like this, okay? And let's start with, there's, there's good news and there's bad news in here, okay? There's the, there's the good stuff and the bad stuff, and the bad stuff is what we're gonna start with first, okay? Because there's a fool in the story. Two home builders, one's a foolish builder and one's a wise builder. Let's start with the foolish builder, okay? So he goes and he decides he's going to build a house, and so he builds the house on, you tell me, because you're reading the Bible right now, what does he build his house on? Sand, Sand okay, well, What's wrong with that? Is, here's a place, you've got, I've got a lot, I got it on a good deal, of course, it's on sand, I got it on a good deal, I'm gonna build my house, and he's gonna build his house on the sand, and so he builds his house. Excuse my drawing, okay? Does that look like a house to you? Yeah. Where's the door handle? 
Now it looks like a face. Anyway, you get what I'm doing, right? You, you get what I'm doing, okay? So he builds his house on the sand. Here's what happens, okay? The, the Bible says that the, the rain came, okay? And the wind blew, and the, the streams rose, and so it started flooding and coming up, and the wind came and blew and beat against the house, and the house fell with a great crash. Okay, that's what's going on. Why? You're, you're, you're such good students. It's gonna get harder, so wake up, okay? So <laughs> this one is because he built his house on the sand, and Jesus says that that is the fool, okay? All right, now, here's, here's the, the wise man. He builds his house on, what does he build his house on? The rock, okay? Well, let's say that there's the sand here, and then here's the dude, sorry, here's the guy, the, the, the fool that built his house on the sand, and his house fell because it was on the sand. So Jesus says, but there was a wise guy, and the, the wise man, the wise builder, he built his house on a, a rock. Okay, here's the picture that I've always had in my mind about the rock. So I feel like the rock is like, this guy built his house over here, that was stupid, that was foolish, because his, you know, what happened, and this guy decided to go over here where there was a big rock sticking out of the ground and he built his house on the rock, right? Because he thought, huh, I think I'm gonna go up there and I'm gonna build my house. I don't know how he did it, you know, put a little ladder here or something to get up there. You go, I'm gonna get up there on that rock and I'm gonna build my house on the rock and when the, when the rains come and everything comes and blows against my house, my house is going to stand and the water can't even get up there. The water's gonna come over here and overtake this guy's house, but. That's what I've always thought it was, okay? That's not what Jesus meant by all that, though. Let me take you over to Luke chapter seven, where Luke adds a couple of details that Matthew doesn't in this storytelling that Jesus gives of the wise man, the wise builder, and the fool. And the fool. He says in Luke 6, 47, he said, this is what Jesus says, I'm gonna show you what it's like when someone comes to me listens to my teaching, and then follows it. Now he's describing the wise man, okay? And, the, and I want you to notice the action words involved in the builder. The builder comes to Jesus, the builder listens to his teaching, and then he goes out and follows the teaching. He says, I'm gonna show you what someone looks like who does these three things. It is like a person building a house who, uh-oh, what does he do? He digs deep, and lays the foundation on solid rock. Here's what Jesus is talking about. Here's the person, this is the builder, here's the sand, and this guy comes along and he excavates down below the sand line, and he gets down to solid rock, and then he builds his house. Do you see that? This is what Jesus is talking about. In fact, he actually says, literally, he's talking about that word solid rock. He says it's like a person building a house that digs deep and lays the foundation on bedrock. That's the word right there is bedrock. I looked up what bedrock is, and bedrock is a consolidated rock, meaning it is solid and tightly bound. It is hard, solid rock beneath surface materials such as soil and gravel. Guess what? That AI produced that for me. That's my first experience with AI, and at the end it says, I hope this was helpful. <laughs> I said, this is creepy. That's all this is, okay? <laughs> that changed things for me in my perspective of this thing. He didn't, the builder didn't go up and find a rock somewhere and put it on it. The builder dug down deep, Jesus said, and built the rock, put his foundation on solid bedrock. Nothing more solid than bedrock. And if you notice, he's down in the ground. If you put it up on a hill, you're kind of vulnerable to the winds and the hurricanes and all that. But this is the person who does the work, the pre-work to dig down deep into the soil and get down to bedrock and say, aha, this is where I'm building my house on bedrock. Let me ask you the question, because it has to be answered. What is the rock? Jesus says the wise man built his house on the rock. What is the rock? Jesus. See, they always say that. We always say Jesus is the rock. 
I want to challenge your thinking on that. Of course Jesus is the rock. He's the rock of our salvation. He's the rock of ages. He's, Jesus is the rock, okay? But that's not what the illustration is teaching us. Because the two men, two builders, they both came to Jesus. They both heard Jesus teaching. And the wise man did not do, did not put into practice. I mean, the fool did not put into practice what Jesus said. The wise man put it into practice. And so the rock that you built the house on, that this wise man built his house on, is not Jesus Christ. It's the listening, the hearing, and the listening and the doing of the word. The rock that we need to build our lives upon and our houses on is the doing of what Jesus tells us to do. If we will listen and then obey and put it into practice, we will be the wise man who built this house on the rock. That makes sense to you? And I say it this way, it's not just I love Jesus. Now my house will stand. Come on, anybody want to challenge me on that? I'll take it. I'll challenge. I'll, I... What you have to understand is that the wisdom in house building in the kingdom is doing what Jesus tells you to do. You can say I love Jesus. You can say I know Jesus. But if you don't listen to Jesus' words and put them into practice in your life, you will not safeguard your family and your house from destruction, from all the attack of the stormy things that are gonna happen in your life on this earth. Two builders, both had choices to make. Both had listened to the words of Jesus. Both had to make a choice to obey and put those words into practice in their lives, literally building their houses on the very words of Jesus. They're just like you and me, my friends. Each of us are building our houses, our lives. And what we do with the words of Jesus will determine our blessing and determine the outcome about the building process of building our lives. The question is, as we work on this, what building blocks will you choose and what materials will you choose to include in the building of your home and what work are you willing to do? Are you willing to do the work of excavating down and get down to the bedrock, hearing what Jesus says and putting it into practice in order to be a wise builder? Well, here we go. Um, building block number one is today. And building block number one is God's love. Choose it first. Now, I just need to speak to some of you that are gonna sit here and be like, wow. Um, let me. We're starting from the very beginning, the very basics of house building in a life with Jesus Christ. So those of you who have been following the Lord for many years and have already been building upon the solid foundation of Jesus and his words and putting them into practice, I just need you to be patient as we work through the first couple of weeks because um, Jesus is gonna get up into all of our grills at one point or another on this study, all right? And he's gonna be um, confronting all of us, but each week we'll go deeper in our, into this thing of obedience um, to the Lord. So I just need you to hang on. If you've been with Jesus for a while, this might sound very elementary to you, but this is the starting point. This is the very beginning. And those of you who've ever built a house know that if you don't start right, then your house is messed up all the way through. You've got to get it settled and started on the right foundation, and that's what we're doing here. So here we go. First thing is this, when we're dealing with God's love is, we must choose God over self. That is a foundational choice for every single one of us as we get started in this building process. We must choose God over self. Like everything else in life, <clears throat> when it comes to God, you and I have a choice to make. Um, no one is neutral when it comes to responding to God and his love. And like it or not, you and I are what we are today, and you and I are where we are today because of some conscious decisions that we've made along the way, right? Uh, not so sure about that. 
My life is a result of all the bad things that have happened to me. That's what my life is a result of. Um, right? I mean, I am the way I am because my dad was too hard on me. Um, I am the way that I am today because my mommy didn't love me enough. I am the way I am today because I was chubby whenever I was a kid and my mom made me wear huskies and people made fun of me because I was husky. I wasn't fat, I was husky. And I made sure they understood that. Don't laugh, it's real. And it, it hurt me. Bad. I didn't get to wear Garanimals because the Garanimals, they didn't have bear size. So they had huskies for kids like me. I am the way that I am because my friends made fun of me. I am the way that I am because I was always picked last for kickball. That's why I am the way that I am. Um, our world, you're, you're smiling at me like you're silly, Phil. It's not silly. This is what our world is teaching our children. This is what our culture is teaching the next generation, that they are victims, and they're not responsible for the outcomes of their lives based on the choices that they made with what to do with their lives or what to do with everything that happened to them during the living of their lives. And I want you to hear me loud and clear on this, and I, I want to be very empathetic, and I want to be very careful, um, because I'm mocking it at this point, okay? Well, it, when I was a kid, it really did hurt. You know, I, I didn't like people making fun of that, that I was husky. Um, it, that was real pain, but I had a choice to make. My parents helped me make some really good choices as to what to do with that pain. I purposely left off the list and kind of joked about the list. There are some really things I can list on a list that, that people would use as excuses as to why I am the way that I am today. I am the way that I am today because some really bad people did some really awful things to me. That's real. It is. But those bad things done by those bad people, I want you to hear me, they don't have to, you are, if you're a believer in Christ, actually, if you, period, forget whether you're a believer in Christ, they, those things and those people do not have to define who you are today and define what you live like today and what your future looks like. They do not. They don't have to limit you. Those things that have happened to you that in your life do not have to be a limiting factor to say, I can't do these things that God wants me to do because bad things happen to me. That is, that is your choice to make I want to present to you. You get to choose how you will respond and what you will do with that hurt. You get to choose what you're going to do with all that pain that has brought upon you. And this is just the reality of life and if you want to live your life, and if you want your house to withstand all the storms that are trying to kill you, they're, they're actually trying to strip you of everything you have and tear your house down, that's what the storms are designed to do. If you want to outlast the hurricanes in your life, foundation block number one, you've got to choose God over yourself. Write that down somewhere big. Put it on a poster. Put it on the walls of your home and hopefully you'll catch with your children as they walk every single day out of your home to remind themselves, choose God over yourself today. Get up every morning, friends, and put your feet on the ground and say, today I choose God over myself. Amen. That's a foundational choose. Did you know that the whole of God's word, this entire Bible, is like a big run-on sentence. It's a, like a big run-on story about the choices that people made where they had to choose between themselves and choose between God. They had to choose between, am I gonna listen to God and obey God or am I gonna listen to myself and go my own way or listen to the voices that are around me telling me things and go that way and go that direction. Faced with that choice and then having to live with the consequences of those choices, whether good or bad. From the very beginning, Adam and Eve, very beginning of time, the very first people on earth, they had a choice to make. 
And that choice had consequences that it would impact not only their lives and future, but the very lives and futures of the entire world, of all humanity for all time. God puts them in a perfect environment where they could do anything they wanted with no boundaries. But because he wanted to test their love for him, he put a tree in the middle of the garden which became the mountain or the monument of choice in the middle of their perfect world. And God put it there so that they would have a choice. And you may be like, oh, what choice is that? Whether they're gonna choose him or they're gonna choose themselves. Simple as that. Look at Genesis 2.15. I'm gonna have it on the screen. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work the land and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free, get this now, listen to these words. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden but you must not eat from the one tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Back in chapter one, verse 29, this is what God said. I'm giving you every plant and every tree on the face of the earth. All of its fruit is yours to eat freely with no limits and no regulations. Just enjoy it. It's for you. I've given it to you to enjoy. Oh, by the way, one little thing, just one little tiny thing, there's a tree in the middle of the garden. Don't eat the fruit from that tree. You now have a choice to make about a little thing called obedience. Are you going to listen to me and do what I say, or are you gonna follow your own voice or someone else's voice? And what did they do? They made the wrong choice. They chose the wrong thing. They chose themselves instead of God. And all mankind, including you and me, have been spiraling out of control ever since, trying to deal with the consequences of the choice they made that day to obey their inner desires and to obey the voice of the devil who was taking the form of a serpent and lied to them instead of listening to God and obeying God. And then they passed it on to all of us. First with their children. Remember Cain and Abel? Okay, two brothers, sons of Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel were faced with a choice. Do I choose me or do I choose God? God said, this is the kind of sacrifice I want you to bring. Abel made a choice to bring the sacrifice and obey God and bring the right sacrifice to God. Abel or Cain decided, nah, I'm gonna think I'm gonna do my own thing. This makes sense to me. I'm gonna do my own thing. God will be fine with that. And he brought his sacrifice. The Bible tells us that God rejected Cain's sacrifice because it was disobedient and he accepted Abel's. At that point, you would have thought Cain would have made a decision for God on the side of God and say, oh God, I'm sorry. And I repent. I'm sorry that I did what I did and I disobeyed you. Please forgive me. And he would have received God's forgiveness if he had done that. But instead, he gets mad, he gets angry, and he goes out and kills his brother Abel. How awesome is that? What does that say about the true intents of a person's heart? He had a choice, he could have chosen God, but he chose himself. How about Noah, remember Noah? Well, the Bible says that Noah chose righteousness for himself and for his family. And as the result, Noah and his entire family was saved from the flood and the rest of the world died by their own choice. The whole world had a choice and the rest of the world, so God saves Noah because he chose righteousness and saved his family and the rest of the world died as a result of their own choice. You remember Lot, Abraham's brother? So I'm sorry if these are stories you don't remember, but there was Abraham, and Abraham and Lot were brothers, and they had this, their clans were growing, and they were in the promised land, and, God's, and Abraham says, you know what, we're too big. You pick a spot to live, and you go find that, and then um, I'll go wherever you don't wanna go. You get the first pick. You know what Lot did? Lot had a choice. Where am I gonna live? Where am I gonna live? Ooh, ooh, ooh where do I see? And he says this, he, he, he pitched his gaze upon Sodom, Sodom was known as the most wicked city on the planet at the time. And that's where he chose to live and to take his family. 
consequences of his choices. His wife goes into the salt business. You can read about that. And the rest of his life spirals into chaos and out of control. You don't even want to read the things that happened in his family as a result of the poor choice that he made just as to where he would live. Write this down somewhere. Good things come from good choices. Bad things come from poor choices. Here's something we use all the time when we're counseling and we've got people that are coming and they're counseling and they're like, my life is falling apart and I'm just in despair and I'm depressed and I'm in full of anxiety and things just aren't going well and I'm just, I, I can't even function anymore because of all that. We all, we all want to say, let's just talk about the choices that you're making because a universal truth is this. If, if you do bad, you're going to feel bad. Pretty simple, Right? If you do good, you're going to feel good. Which, what are you going to choose? You have a choice. You get to choose. Blessings chase the righteous, the Bible says. Curses chase the wicked. What are you going to choose for your life? Make the right choice and everything else will follow. You get to choose. If you want your house to stand, choose God over yourself. He is standing there with arms open wide to receive you unto himself, but you have to choose him. He doesn't force himself on his people. He's not that kind of God. He offers you the choice. Are you gonna come to me and listen to me? If you do, I will bless you. If you don't, you're on your own. Let me know how that goes for you. Second choice. Who's messing with the clocks? It is not 10.07. Look at everybody look at their clocks. I'm in massive trouble. Well, then stop wasting time talking about it, Phil. Get on with it. All right, here we go, number two. We must accept God's love for ourselves. We must choose God over ourselves, and we must accept God's love for ourselves ourselves. I want to just, you need to hear this, okay? There is a real God. There is a God who is alive, and there's only one. He is Jehovah. He is the God of the Bible. He is the creator of the universe. He is the God who created all that we know. He is the God who placed Adam and Eve that we spoke of earlier in the garden. He is the God who made a way for all mankind to be reconciled, to be healed from, this, from their sins, to be redeemed unto himself and saved from the sins that started with Adam and Eve that we all live in now. He is the God who raises humble, repentant sinners to life in his son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that this God that we're talking about, that I'm talking, there is only one, there are no other gods. You hearing me? There's no other God that is alive. There are gods that people make there are, they're idols, they're not, no God anyone has ever made outside of the living God has ever done one thing to help their people because they're not alive. They don't exist, they're just figments of imagination. There is only one God and that God of the Bible says that he is love. Not just that he's loving, but that he truly is love. God is love. His very nature is love, and love originated in him and generates from him. In fact, without God, there is no true love that exists. This love, of course, that we're talking about is sacrificial love, self-sacrificing love to meet the needs of those all around me instead of meeting just my own needs. That's what this love is, and you can't know this love outside of God. God has this love and is this love and this love is in him and it originates from him and you can't experience it or give it out unless you're in him, unless you've received and accepted his love for yourself. Then you know what this love is. Otherwise, you do not know what this love is. It's the reality that every person here must embrace. Every person starts here. I choose God over myself, and I choose God's love for myself. Let me share a familiar verse with you. In fact, if you haven't been walking with Jesus very long, you know this verse. It's John 3, 16. Simple, but foundational. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Perish from what? Perish from your sin. The Bible is clear that because of sin in the world, we are born into sin, and therefore we are sinners. And because we're sinners, we, are, we fall short of God and his glory. We can't get to God. And the wages of sin is death. But God gives us a gift, and his gift is in his son, Jesus Christ. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he makes a way for us to come out of the sin that we have. All we have to do is acknowledge that we're sinners, humble ourselves, repent of our sin to the Lord, and receive his love, his gift of love, Jesus Christ. Receive him unto ourselves and open that box, that Christmas gift of salvation and eternal life that is in Jesus Christ. That's all we have to do is receive it for ourselves. Make the choice to accept salvation, accept God's love for ourselves. Look at this verse, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. How good is it, how wonderful is it that God loves you so much that he's not expecting you to figure it out or to fix yourself before you can be saved. He says, you know what, I know that you're, it's helpless for you and hopeless for you. You're in your sin, so I'm gonna come to you with the only solution, and that is my son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, my son, is going to come and take your sin away from you when he dies on the cross and sheds his blood. And because of my love for you, I'm sending him. Not because I understand that you can get your way out of your sin. You can't get your way out of your sin. I'm gonna show you how much I love you that in the middle of your sinning, I'm going to send my son to die for those sins because I am love. Choose me. Some of you might be saying, yeah, I'm not buying it. Um, God might be love, but I don't think he's very loving. And if I were to spend some time with you, I would come a story and you would conclude with something like, if God was really a God of love, then how could he possibly, and he would, you would then come out with your complaint and your grievance that you have against God and his so-called love, and it would sound something like, you know, uh, some really bad things have happened to me, and how can God be a God of love and let this thing happen to me? I want you to hear me. I've been there and I know what you're talking about and I know how that feels. Something was left undone and it devastated you. Something or someone broke your heart and you can't get your head around how he, this God of love, could love you and at the same time let that thing happen to you or to those you love. I wanna just say this, I, I'm really sorry that these things happen and that they've happened to you. I'm really sorry that there are some really awful people in this world that do some really awful things. But the only way out of the box that we find ourselves in when we're upset about all of that and can't figure out God's love is to embrace God's love for what it really is, not for what you think that it should be. I don't know if that makes any sense, but what you and I have done when we get to this place of disappointment and we get to this place of bitterness in our hearts against God is that we have self-defined God's love. You have in your heart and I have in my heart and mind that this love must manifest itself in certain ways or else God is not a loving God. It's like this is my concept of love and the God who made me, he better conform to my view of what is loving. Okay, that's the way we think and we're really good at doing this and we don't mean to do it. But it's what we do and this kind of thinking derails our lives from going forward, especially going forward with God. And it's because we don't have the proper view of what a loving God like God, a God who is love and is loving, is doing when he allows these things to happen in our lives. So I want to share with you, can I, you can give me permission to go overboard here? I mean, it's already time to shut this thing down, but let me just give them to you quickly, okay? These are fundamental truths about God's love. The first is this that God is a 
God's love is a protective love, but it's not a preventive love. Emerson, you just birthed, you didn't, but your wife did, just birthed a new little baby girl, right? Okay, so she gets older and she grows, she's starting to grow up and some really bad people want to do some really bad things to her and you're standing there. What are you going to do? You're going to protect her, okay? Um, to what degree? To what level? Just until, until your life is threatened? I'll give my life for her. You'll say what? I'll give my life for her. You'll give your life for her? Yeah. Of course you would. It's what any loving, normal dad would do, right? Anybody disagree? Of course. I'm not gonna just protect my daughter. I'm gonna give my life in protection of my daughter. I'm going to be the ultimate protector because that's what dads do. Loving dads do that for their children, right? Okay, so what about God? So is God not loving? If God, who is sovereign and is all-powerful and can make anything happen that he wants to in the universe, allow some bad people to do some bad things to your daughter? Yes, he's unloving if he lets that happen. If you don't have the proper view of God's love, And this helps us. God's love is a protective love, but it's not a preventive love. God doesn't always jump in and prevent bad things from happening to us. And you'd be like, yeah, well, I wish he would. I do too, okay? But that is the reality of God's love. And it's because God's got a higher purpose than your pleasure for you in mind. God's got a higher purpose than your lack of pain or your lack of heartbreak for you in mind. That's the way of it. Let me say it this way. God allows pain. Well, I wish you wouldn't do that. Yeah, well, I do too. I, I, you know, I, I wish I could sit around and watch football and eat ding-dongs and drink Diet Cokes and maintain this beautiful physique that I have, but it comes with hard work. You've heard it, right? No pain, no. No pain, no. You know this, right? You understand this. Well, so does God. Little kids can't even grow up in this world without having growing pains. And all you moms are like, oh, I wish I could give them the little pill to take care. I don't want them to have pains. Stop it. Let them grow up. The pain is there for a reason. They're called growing pains. God understands this. We need to get a hold of this. Pain is part of growth. Look at this. God allows pain to humble us so that we will see how much we need him. Isn't it true that many of us here would have never found God had it not been some painful experience that drove us to him for help and salvation? And if you would never have found God without going through that pain, then allowing that in your life was like the most loving thing that God could do for you. You hear me? You you agree? That was the very thing that brought you to your knees so that you could see how much you need him. Here's another thing. God allows pain to refine us so that we would be more like him. I'm not gonna spend any time on this because we've done this over and over again, but Romans 28, 28, and 29 says, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. You're like, I wish these things wouldn't happen. Well, it's happening, and he's got a plan, and he's working it out for the good, for your good. And what is the good? To conform you to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what the good is. He's refining you through that pain so that you'll be more like him and his son. God's love is a protecting love, but he's not a preventing God. It's not a preventing love. He always allows pain to restore us so that we'll come back to him. Some people walk away from God. They start following their own voices and their own desires or the desires of the things of the world. They stop listening to God. And let me ask you, that's happened to some of you when you did that. Did God tie you up until you came to your senses to keep you from hurting yourself or from hurting others and from walking down the wrong path of destruction? No, he did not. 
Not at all. He will let you go and suffer the consequences, full in your face, the consequences of your sin and your poor choices, with the goal of driving you back to him and to his loving, gracious arms. God protects us more than we even know, but in his wisdom, he chooses not to be a preventing God. And I would submit to you, that might be the most loving thing that God has ever done for you and for me. God's love is a providing love, but it's not a pampering love. Does he meet your needs? Is he a providing God? Yes, he is. Philippians 4.19, we've all memorized that my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Of course he's a providing God, absolutely, according to the glorious riches of his son, but he's not a pampering God. God gives us what we need, but not always what we want. Hey, parents, here, here's, some, here's some great parenting tips right here. Write them down, come on. God gives us what we need, but not always what we want. God gives us what we need, but not always when we want it. God gives us what we need, but not always how we want it. God's a provisional God, but he's not a pampering God. Got one more? Here we go, one more. God's love is a perfecting love. God's love is a perfecting love. We're all under construction, and the master builder God himself in his loving way is working on each one of us. Nothing comes into our lives that surprises God. Nothing comes into our lives that he's not lovingly and actively superintending with the goal of perfecting us for every good work. Listen, my friends, he loves you. His eyes are on your every move. You're never far from his presence. He counts the hairs on your head. He saves up your tears in bottles and your prayers in bowls. God loves you, but you must choose this love. God loves you, and if you believe in him, you will be able to know his love. My prayer for each one of us today is this, that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. There's the perfecting ministry of his love. God's love, choose it first. Let's stand together. <clears throat> I'm really sorry that I'm over time. I will do better for the next service. They'll, they'll... <clears throat> you just bow your heads and um, I, just, I, need, I need to just ask this question. Do you know God's love? Have you accepted God's love for yourself? Have you received it? Have you come to a place where you have humbled yourself? Admitted that you're a sinner, repented of those sins before God and accepted his gift of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Storms are coming in your life, my friend. Your house will not stand outside of God and his love. You've got to choose it first. I can't make you choose it, and God doesn't make you choose it. But if I could choose it for you, I would. And the reason is because I have chosen it, and I know how awesome his love is. I wouldn't want to go through a day without a relationship, a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ made possible by God and his amazing love for you. Choose it today. You might be visiting with us online. Choose it today. Don't let another day go by. If your heart is being convicted by the Holy Spirit today that I need this love and I need to get it today, then don't wait. Don't listen to any other voices. Listen to the voice of God, the Holy Spirit right now. Don't harden your heart towards it. Just listen to it and respond to it and give your heart to Jesus today. Humble yourself. Call on his name. Repent of your sin and receive his love 
for yourself. That is my prayer for you today. If you need help with that, whether you're visiting online or here in the building, we're here to help you with that. Don't leave without his love. Help us, Lord, as we build our homes, that we would build with the proper materials, that they will build with hearts and ears that are open to what you have to say to us and that we'll be obedient as we walk out of this place right now, Lord. Help us with it. We love you and we thank you for your awesome love for us. And it is in Jesus' powerful name that we pray. Amen. All right, turn around to somebody on your way out and just say, I'm really sorry Phil went so over today. And um, it's just, he'll be okay next week. And God bless you as you go.